So great to be here with you all. So, um, as Sister Antoniana said, this is just a little story about um, the Lord's grace and His mercy in my life, um, which has been so tremendous, and I love thinking about it. So, I, my name is Sister Faustina Maria Pia, and um, I am a novice with the Sisters of Life, and I'm from Connecticut, and I am the youngest of eight kids, and I have a twin sister, and who actually, not identical, but my twin sister just gave birth to her first little girl, first little um, child, two days ago. So when I was traveling up here, <laughs> found out. So very excited. And her name is actually Maria Pia. So we have a special bond <laughs> already. Um, so I grew up in a Catholic family, and uh, which was a huge blessing. But it was also difficult because at certain points, you have to make your faith your own. And uh, middle school, high school was hard because um, I was afraid of what my friends would think if they knew how you know faithful my family was, and so I didn't talk about my faith, didn't talk about God with my family, with my friends. So my faith was very compartmentalized; it was off to the side. Um, but as I grew older, I knew that I wanted um, to be unafraid to share it. I wanted my faith to be a part of my life more, um, and so I chose to go to a very Catholic university, which some of my siblings had gone to. Um, but as a freshman, when I walked in, it was just like, it was, it was overwhelming because there I was so far from home. And um, just if you had gone into my dorm room my freshman year, you probably would have seen this flashing sign that said fun. <laughs> because I was such on this quest for to know everybody, to get involved with everything, um, to have everybody know me. And so this quest for popularity, for fun, for achievement was overwhelming and really draining. And so instead of going to this very Catholic university to dive into my faith more, it was more this big distraction. And so um, I was blessed with the opportunity to, tra to uh, travel abroad, and that really changed my perspective. So um, there I was in Europe. Every weekend we had the opportunity to travel, and um, just the beautiful landscapes, you know, up to the Alps, down to the Mediterranean Sea, going to all these historical sites, being like, oh, this, you're standing now where Charlemagne was crowned, or these ruins are from like millennia past, um, all these religious sites, you know, this is where the Blessed Mother appeared, these are where thousands of people were cured, and it was just the grandeur of it all was starting to hit me. I was like, wow, I'm so small, I'm such a small piece of this puzzle, you know? And, um, you know, I'd talk to my friends, be like, hey, do you want to go to Paris this weekend for a long weekend? And, um, and we'd go to Paris, and then a few days later we'd be on a train ride home. And I distinctly remember coming home from Paris this one weekend, and um, I was sitting in the train station, we were pulling out, and I was so upset inside. I should be so thankful, but I was so upset inside. I was like, you know what? I didn't get to see everything. I didn't get to experience everything. I'm not ready to leave. I want more. And I started to realize how thirsty I was inside. I was like, gosh, I, nothing is satiating me. All these adventures that I'm going on, nothing is satiating me. And so, um, you know, just all this beauty, this mystery that was surrounding me, it was so captivating. Um, but I wanted more. I kept on wanting more. That semester, um, there was a little chapel where Jesus was exposed for adoration all week long. And I started to go with my friend. And it was the only place that I felt comfortable being okay with how thirsty I was and telling somebody who I thought understood me, be like, oh, Lord, I want more, and I don't know what it is. And um, all over Europe, there was these you know, little pockets of religious that I would see. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, that is the most radical thing I've ever heard of. And I grew up in a Catholic family, but I didn't know many sisters. And um, so it's like, that's the most radical love that I could ever dream of, I could ever think of. They're giving up everything. And so I remember even just thinking about it, toying with it in my head, made me feel almost like a rebel because nobody was, nobody that I knew was becoming a sister. Um, and all the things that I was pursuing, they weren't. Um, so it was just something that I thought of in passing. But when I came back to the States, I kind of fell back into a lot of the distractions of um, previous semesters. Um, dating, and I still had, religious life was kind of still in the, you know, in there, in the mix, but it wasn't anything that I was taking seriously. But what I did do was I got involved with um, a pro-life club on our campus, and some of my friends had heard me talking about religious life and passing, and two of my friends from this club came up to me one day and was like, hey, do you want to visit these sisters in New York? They, they do some pro-life work. We really think you'd like them. And I was like, mm, no, no thanks. Uh -huh. <laughs> And they're like, no, really? You know, just a weekend? And I was like, no, I mean, 
religious life is really neat idea, but to go visit, I was like, I, I don't know what I would say to them, you know. And um, they were like, kept on persisting. And I was finally like, you guys, what's up? I, I said no like four times. <laughs> and they're like, well, it's six hours away, and um, you have a car. And, <laughs> and I was like, OK. But inside, it was kind of a relief, because I was like, I was kind of curious. I wanted to see it. And it was like, you know, I was away from my family. No one had to know, you know? So I went, and two things struck me about the sisters when I visited. The first was that they were so normal. I was like, golly, I can talk to them like I'm talking to my friends and my sisters. Um, you know, joke around with them. One of them was wearing Skechers. Um, uh, it was just like they were normal. And the other thing that was really funny that I noticed about them was that they were so not normal. Um, I was like, golly, they're so happy with all the things that I don't think would make me happy. For some reason, they've given up all these things that I'm pursuing that I'm so consumed in, in trying to navigate my life through with, you know. And um, they're so happy. And there I was so restless. So I couldn't figure it out. But I was like, there's something there. There's like light coming from their eyes that I want somehow. I don't know how to get there, but I want it. And it was the first time I could picture myself as religious, you know, being there with those sisters. Um, but after, when I left, I, I didn't know um, what to make of it all because I still had a desire for marriage and to, to have a family. And so I felt kind of like this you know, freak show with two heads. I was like, I want to get married, have a family, I want to be a sister and love you completely. And I was like, and it was, um, so it was hard because I didn't know what to do with that. And so I thought, you know, my personality is kind of like, all right, I'll just not think much about it. I'll just carry on with my life <laughs> um, kind of nonchalantly. But, and then when I graduated, I, um, I moved back to Connecticut, and I was working for Catholic Charities, and actually went back to school for nursing as well. And all the while, I was coming up in my head with a list of things that I wanted to do with my life that I thought, you know, once I got this, this, and this um, kind of orchestrated in my life, I'd be happy, I'd be fulfilled. And so it was kind of like this unwritten list of, you know, where I wanted to live, where I wanted to work, the kind of guy I was looking for, the type of car I wanted. <laughs> Um, you know, where I wanted to travel. And as I was able to check things off the list, um, to my surprise, I was becoming more and more restless inside. And um, I was upset about that. I was like, I should, I should be happy with this, and I'm not. And, um, and I remember a couple years, it was a couple years after I had graduated, and it was New Year's Eve, and I was just thinking about the next year, you know, resolutions, and all these things. And I felt, I had this feeling of, oh my gosh, I feel like a car going down a hill with its brakes on. Like, I wasn't living my life fully. I was like, I hate this feeling like that I, I'm not living my life fully. And I, I didn't want it to continue. And I didn't know what to do about it. But I said a, kind of like a raw prayer in my heart. I didn't know what to pray. But I was like, I was like God, just help me this year take my foot off the brake. I don't know what that means. I don't know what it's going to look like. But just help me take my foot off the brake. And, you know, all this time that I had been kind of consumed with what I wanted, this focus of me and what I wanted to achieve, because of that focus on me, my prayer life had, had gone down. And with that, you know, the, the struggles with sin and weakness that had intensif intensified. And so it was just, I could feel this restlessness growing within me. And so um, after I prayed that prayer, God listens. He listens. Um, about six weeks later, I uh, was coming home from the hospital. And I kind of dove into my bed. I was just tired, exhausted. But I was so awake inside because I was of this growing restlessness that I just I was in my bed and I just started crying. I was like, God, I um, I don't know what to do. Like, I I want so badly to be happy. And like, just in case you forgot, you know, <laughs> I'm down here. You can help me out. And um, I'm praying to him. And it was a moment that I really felt just like a failure inside, just like a, just so weak. You know, it was like I had done all this work so hard to get to where I was. And yet I was so unhappy. I felt like I wasn't living my own life. And, um, and so I, just, I was just sitting there crying. And one by one, I went through all the desires in my heart just to remind Jesus, just to remind him. And then I knew it was a grace. It was a grace. I'm so thankful. I just knew to one by one give each of those desires to the Lord. I knew I had to do it. So I said, Lord, I give you this. I give you this. I give you this. And it was painful. I felt like I was emptying out my heart, you know? And then all of a sudden, I felt this, like this silence and this lull in my heart. Like it was just this peace and this stillness that I never had known. I had never known. 
And it was finally the opportunity the Lord was waiting for that he was like, hey, you get all this, you know, out of all of what you want out of your heart, then maybe I can tell you what I've created you for, you know? And so it was this peace in my heart. And in that stillness, I heard, not with my ears, but in my heart, I heard the Lord say, I want you for myself. I want you for myself. And I knew, I knew exactly what he was talking about. And I was like, yes. I was like, yes. And um, it was like, you know, I had felt like that girl on that train ride home from Paris being like, I want more, I want more. Like, what is it? And finally he was like, come, let me show you. And, um, and so nothing, nothing could have prepared me for what followed after that. Um, you know, because there I am like crying, you know. I was like, yes, Lord, I'll do it. Yes, Lord, I'll do it. And the next day I was, so, I had such a deep joy and a peace. I felt like I was skydiving. I felt like I wanted to go on the roof of my condo and just like scream like, I'm alive! <laughs> um, because it was like, oh my gosh, this burden of all my own desires, which weren't bad in themselves, but they were just, had me as my focus. And, and I was putting God as someone who was merely going to help me do what I wanted, you know? And all of a sudden it was like, oh my gosh, his will is so freeing. I just felt this freedom um, of living, going, living the life that he had wanted for me. And so um, I told Jesus, I was like, I don't have the energy to look through where you want me. I'll go anywhere, you know, just kind of like, I'll do anything. And so I told him, I was like, Lord, like, I'm so hungry in my heart. My heart is so thirsty for you. It's always been. And now I know where that thirst is to be directed. So it's like, I'll just concentrate on hanging out with you. And then you take care of all the details. So it was what my heart wanted. I was like, I made time for prayer. I started going to mass more regularly. Um, I went to confession more frequently. And it was like, I couldn't stop. It was just like, I wanted to be with him. Um, I felt like I was running towards him. And, um, and it, the beautiful thing is that Jesus was such a gentleman. He opened one door after the next. Literally, it was like, I called up the Sisters of Life to see if they still remembered me. Um, and they did. And, uh, and they're like, oh no. no. <laughs> um, and um, the one weekend that I had available for like months ahead was the come and see. So I was like, oh my gosh, I actually i am free that weekend. And just, you know, one thing after the next, you know, I was a nurse and I was looking for a community that would do nursing because I loved it. And a priest of mine, a uh, friend of mine was like, you know what, you know, we're all, we're all sick and dying. So it's like those in our culture that are the most wounded and, and those that need the most help um, in, in, in a sickness is a moral sickness. And I was using my nursing, um, that physical illness in the hospital to to reach a deeper place of healing where I could pray with my patients and tell them that they weren't alone, that their suffering had value. And so to, to be a sister, to be with those who are especially wounded um, and um, that needed healing, it was, was something that my heart wanted all the more. So it was just beautiful. The Lord was just leading me and guiding me. And um, uh, I'll just end with a quick little, quick little story. Yeah, it was beautiful because also I had some loans that were left over and somebody called me up anonymously and be like, hey, you know, like, do you need any money? I heard you want to enter the convent. I was like, yeah. <laughs> so it was like Jesus really, he took care of every little thing. He, he just wanted me to be with him. So it was beautiful. But I just want to end with, um, so right after I received my habit as a novice, my twin sister got married and I went home um, for the wedding. It was her maid of honor. And um, I was at my parents' house, and I was going through, like I was in my old closet, and my mom had this box in there. I just opened it, and I saw all these documents and papers, school papers and art projects that she had saved over the years of mine. And I was like, oh my gosh, Mom, you can throw this away. And I started to look through it, and she was like, no, no, don't throw anything away. And I started to look through it, and there was an a English project from high school. It must have been like 14 or 15 years old. And it was when we were reading the Canterbury Tales where you know, all the pilgrims on their way to Canterbury, they tell who they are and, you know, a little bit about their personality as they're on their way um, to Canterbury. And the, the assignment was, if you were a pilgrim, what would you, how would you describe yourself? And, you know, as a 14, 15 year old, you can say you're a neurologist or a lawyer, you can make up whatever you wanted. And so I'm reading mine and I was like so shocked because I didn't have any career aspirations, I didn't have any academic pursuits, no traveling, nothing. Mine was simply and boldly, I was like almost embarrassed to read it, was about being in love. It was all, that was my, I had met the man of my dreams, fallen in love, and that was my identity, was that, was him and me. And that was who I was as a pilgrim on this way to Canberra. And I was reading it just in my habit a couple weeks, and I was like, oh my gosh. And then it hit me, I was like, oh, how the Lord, how the Lord fulfilled my desire, how he knew um, better than 
I would have chosen for myself. He chose that I could live my, um, my desire for this, this radical love to, to fulfill the thirst in my heart um, that I knew that I had been made for something more. Um, to love him in this way. So it's a beautiful, beautiful moment of grace and, and um, a beautiful moment of gratitude looking back and being like, wow, the Lord, um, he was patient with me in my, in my stubbornness, but um, patiently waited for me and um, guided me with his love and took care of all the details. And um, I really, really couldn't be um, hoping for anything else.